What I want to do in this lesson is to move away from the conceptions of classical liberalism that we've been talking about um, previously and to explore the concept of modern liberalism in more detail. To look at how these ideas have been taken and then uh, have, been, have been adjusted, have been reformed, have been changed to apply to more modern conceptions of the liberal ideas. So we're going to move away from talking about people like Mary Wollstonecraft, John Locke, uh, uh, and John Stuart Mill, and talk about people such as Isaiah Berlin, and, uh, and most importantly, in my opinion at least, uh, the people like John Rawls. So examining how more modern philosophers have approached liberalism in the development of a more modern conception. And I want to begin by the, looking at the delineation that we've been uh, examining uh, between this idea of positive freedom versus negative freedom, because this is obviously a very important aspect of liberal mindsets and liberal thoughts. Uh, modern liberalism saw a move away from the concept of what we describe through the idea of human nature as egotistical individualism towards something known as developmental individualism. So if you remember back to previous lessons, People like John Locke believe that individuals are inherently individualistic in their outlook and this individualistic outlook related more to this idea of the, 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 the ego, the egotistical, the idea of acting in their own self-interests. Well, modern liberals talk more about this idea of developmental individualism, a shift away from the concept that people have the freedom to seek their own uh, their own individual goals, their own individual egotistical output, out acting in their own best interest, towards uh, the focus on the person. The philosopher Thomas Hill Green, for example, argued that poverty and inequality ought to be tackled to maintain the conditions without which a free exercise of human facilities is impossible. And this is, of course, uh, broadly uh, folded into this conception of the modern liberal idea. As a result of this, freedom is described as the absence of restraint, but also as a positive freedom. So we note that the absence of restraint is this idea of negative freedom, which we've explored in previous lessons. But freedom, too, is known as positive freedom. And we made, uh, we made it very clear in previous lessons um, that the uh, philosopher Isaiah Berlin uh, makes the delineation between positive and negative freedom. And the description that is cited there is the delineation between the freedom to do something versus the freedom from some kind of restraint. So negative freedom is described as the absence of restraint. Positive freedom is, the, is described as the ability for one to act in a way and be free to act in some kind of way. With a shift in the concept of individualism that we see within the modern con uh, concept of liberals, um, there is also a shift in the role that the state has to play within the broader liberal society. So to protect positive freedom, the ability for somebody to act in a certain way, and to protect this idea of developmental individualism, the state ought to be uh, extended. Uh, as such, a welfare state can be justified to bring about what is known as equality of opportunity. John Maynard Keynes argued that the state would need to intervene in the economy to ensure this equality of opportunity. Equality of opportunity is this idea that everybody has the equal opportunity to do whatever they so choose. It does not mean that there is an equality of outcome. It does not mean that everybody is exactly the same in terms of their socioeconomic status. But what is the case is that if somebody wants to and has the uh, wants to uh, develop and uh, develop uh, professionally, uh, develop some kind of skills to have the opportunity to do whatever they want, um, this should be provided for by the state. They should have the, an equality of opportunity so that everybody has the same starting point but that as a result of this, there will be different endpoints, there will be different um, outcomes. So this is the commonly accepted and often, um, uh, often protected idea. Um, and John Maynard Keynes argued that this could be done through intervention in the economy to ensure the equality of opportunity. So gone are the days where we can believe that uh, the concept of the free market can just simply ensure um, the, the, the liberal establishment of, 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 of society and, and equality. Modern liberals also argue that society has discriminated against certain minorities and as such a, an idea known as positive discrimination may be necessary to achieve true equality. 
So one of the things that ties quite neatly into the equality of opportunity is the idea of systemic oppression, the idea that the systems that are in place today have with them the echoes of the previously existing systems that did oppress certain minority groups, minority groups often on the basis of racial, uh, of racial differences, often on the basis of gender, sexual differences, or maybe even sexual orientation. The aim with positive discrimination, therefore, is to implement programs which are said to uh, discriminate, but uh, discriminate in favor of these minority groups. So things like, for example, an affirmative action program. Affirmative action programs may allow for uh, individuals within different workplaces or within university institutions to be able to take into account various uh, minorities within society and uh, and the historical systemic oppression that they may have suffered as a result uh, of this um, historical uh, of this historical discrimination and to take that into account when making decisions about uh, achieving some kind of um, uh, equity within society so essentially uh, a good example of a of a of a uh, of an affirmative action program may be a university when looking at who they're going to take on as students um factoring in the concept of the race of the potential student uh, as a result of um, the systemic oppression of minorities from from his from history all of these things can contribute to this concept of social liberalism and this contra and this concept of trying to um, stamp out any kind of systemic or systematic oppression of certain minorities within society. Now, arguably the most important of the modern liberals is that of John Rawls. Now, Rawls was incredibly fundamental when it came to the conception of modern liberalism. Um, his theories of uh, of society relate more to the concept of justice. He wrote a few works, one of them being uh, a theory of justice, which is his foundational magnum opus, if you will. And ultimately, the concept of a theory of justice uh, asks us to uh, devise a system whereby we can actually develop a conceptualization of a just society. Uh, he would then build upon this work in previous in, in subsequent uh, books and subsequent writings. So uh, things like uh, the book Political Liberalism, A Law of Peoples, seeks to take his theory of justice or to take a theory of justice and try to internationalize it and turn it into a theory of global justice. Ultimately, within his theory of justice, he develops a conception known as the original position. Now, what the original position invites us to do is invites us to look at a thought experiment. Now, imagine you were in what he describes as the original position, and it is essentially the understanding that we are going to, as a group, as a society, we're going to um, have a blank canvas and we are going to construct a society that we would like to live in as a group. We all have equal say. Everybody has a single vote as to the things that are going to go into this new society that is going to be our society that we're going to construct and that we're going to live in and that we're going to enjoy. Now, from this point, you would understand that an individual may uh, be acting in their self-interests. So an individual might be rich, for example, and so they might try and vote for a society that has low taxation. An individual might be poor, and so as a result, they might vote for a society that has, um, that has a very strong welfare state and supports um, those who are a part of the lower classes. If you are black, you may support affirmative action programs to give you a, an advantage over other people when it came to uh, university admissions or employment. Etc. 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 So what John Rawls tells you to do, invites you to do, is that okay? Now we are in this position where we are going to um, construct a society. We are in the original position. We're going to put everybody behind something known as the veil of ignorance, whereby nobody knows anything about themselves. Okay? They are uh, they are behind this veil of ignorance. The things they know about themselves is that um, they they know the basic uh, foundational concepts of human uh, of human development and, and human life, of course. Um, and what they know is that uh, there is a scarcity of resources, okay, and that every single individual is going to have different uh, motives and aims. So essentially, they know that's all people know when they're behind this veil of ignorance. If you are put behind in a veil of ignorance, okay, um, you would not know if you are rich or if you are poor. You would not know if you are uh, if you are black or if you are white. If you're a man or if you're a woman. So what rules? 
tells us and what Rawls argues is that the people in this original position behind this veil of ignorance would be able to construct an equal society because they would not know whereabouts they would be positioned within this society. So if you don't know if you are rich or poor in this society and you have an equal say over for everybody else as to what this society is going to look like, well, it would be in your best interests to have a society that represents as many people as possible. We would have a society that benefits everybody. OK, so you wouldn't vote for a society that would only benefit the rich or would only benefit the poor or would only benefit men or only benefit women. You would have a society that tries to benefit everybody as much as humanly possible. This is what John Rawls describes as the way in which you can construct a just society. Uh, because people who are um, who do know of their positions within society will be acting in their interests to benefit themselves in that position. If you do not know your position within society, then you cannot be able to work out what um, is going to be in your best interest. So you would only vote for what is in the best interest of the most amount of people.